This is the pirate talk. Uh, it's actually got a name, but people have been coming up to me all week saying, you're the pirate guy doing the pirate talk. So I've just renamed it to the pirate talk. I hope that's okay with everybody. Doesn't substantively change what it's actually about, which is obviously pirates. You can tweet me here. Please feel free to harass me while I'm speaking. It's always great. My watch will vibrate and it's thoroughly annoying. So I love being kept on my toes. Uh, welcome. Uh, before I get started, I just want to follow on from Yara's welcome at the uh, opening keynote yesterday to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on, we're on today, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, I'm heavily involved with the Aboriginal community in Tasmania, uh, so I'd like to pay my respects to the community here who have continued to maintain their identity, culture, rights, and so on through invasion, dispossession, all sorts of other terrible things. Uh, so I pay my respects to elders, past, present, emerging of, of them and other communities, uh, especially those who are at Melbourne Games Week who have had a few conversations with people so far. Uh, so, this is a great quote from an actual pirate. Uh, it's in the talk abstract. It kind of summarizes this whole talk and pirate leadership in general. Uh, when it comes down to it, pirates were a pretty interesting bunch of people and I would like you to learn more about them. This talk has one very concrete takeaway and that is that good group dynamics are good. Uh, I hope that makes sense. That's pretty much it, really. You can leave now if you want to go see Rihanna Pratchett or Fortnite or one of the inclusion panels. That really is the significant takeaway of this talk. Uh, pirates knew that good group dynamics promoted really good cooperative action and great outcomes, and they worked towards that to achieve their goals. Good group dynamics are fantastic. I really am not joking. That is the takeaway. So now I've got the takeaway out of the way. Let's talk about pirates in more detail. Uh, I'm Paris. I'm not a pirate. This is me pretending to be a dinosaur, not a pirate. It's the closest thing. I searched for pirate and the AI that controls my image library decided this was a pirate. So there's also a picture of me, so that is why I put it in there. Uh, close enough. I, I'm from Tasmania, which is a literal paradise that you should all visit. Uh, this is a picture of Tasmania. It's real. Come to Tasmania. Uh, we have more fibre to the premises than any other state and great coffee and cheap office space. It is a literal paradise. This is my office internet connection which costs like $200 a month. Find that on the mainland for that price. Go on. So uh, I'm co-founder of a game development studio. We're about to turn 11 years old, which makes us one of the longest running game studios in Australia because game studios die constantly. It's tragic, not, not positive. Uh, we're called Secret Lab. We're best known for our work on children's games, uh, for some of Australia's biggest identities like Play School and Qantas. And we've also worked, been working recently on the BAFTA and IGF award winning, somehow, game Night in the Woods. Uh, which is great. We love Night in the Woods. Everyone loves Night in the Woods, apparently. Uh, we're also known for our creation, Yarn Spinner, the narrative game development framework. And we write a lot of books. We've written like a million different books on everything from space to game development. Uh, none of this stuff is relevant to my talk. I just felt I should tell you that I'm very important. Um, I'm here to talk about pirates. And I was very surprised that this talk got accepted. I submitted a whole bunch of very serious, important game development topics, and they picked this one. Uh, I really just wanted to get a history talk into a game development conference. I've been trying to get this talk accepted somewhere for months now, and great success, it's here. I actually do have a history degree. Uh, I have a PhD in computer science, but my first primary passion was actually history, so I have a long neglected history interest that occasionally rears its head, which means I give talks like this at conferences that have nothing to do with history. Uh, this is a fluff talk. It really has very little to do with game development. I've made some links which I think are interesting, and I hope that you would consider why and how I've actually submitted this talk. So the talk is fluff, the concepts are not. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it regardless. Really is just an excuse to jibber about pirates. Pirates are really cool. You probably think you know a bit about pirates. You probably don't know as much as you think you do. Uh, I hope you look into them a bit more. Uh, I really just want to talk about pirates lots. Uh, so my mother, who was on Twitter, tweeted this to me this morning. Uh, I apparently made this when I was six, which she kept. And in response to me tweeting an ad about my talk, she tweeted this back at me. You can follow my mother, she's lovely. Um, but I made this cork pirate, and my mother's had it in a box somewhere. As you can see, it's covered in fluff. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd put this out here. My mother is very proud of me and loves pirates as well. And I've loved pirates since I was a kid. Uh, one of the reasons I think talking about pirates is particularly relevant is because this current era of games, we're kind of exploring collectivization, unioning, unionism, things like that, important things that promote better action together. Uh, I was really impressed and happy this morning when Kate Edwards at the opening Lightnings mentioned the importance of collectivising, acting together. I really do think people can learn a lot about 
how and why things work the way they do by looking at history. Uh, and pirates are a really good place to start looking at that. Pirates are fun. So before we talk about pirates, we should probably define what a pirate is. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think a pirate is. You might be thinking, you know, what is this madman talking about? I know what a pirate is. It's, I've seen Pirates of the Caribbean. I've played Sea of Thieves. I've dealt with LeChuck in Monkey Island. Uh, why is this irritating man at our lovely game development conference talking about pirates? Uh, well, we need to do a little bit of a history lesson because we need to contextualise what I mean by a pirate. Uh, this is a description of pirates from the fabulously titled A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates, uh, which we'll come back to. But I don't know about you, but this description, and ignoring the fact it says men because it's from a certain era, uh, kind of sounds like game developers to me. Um, game developers are strange people who, you know, the rest of the software industry doesn't really know what to make of us. The creative film industry kind of thinks we should be there but shouldn't be there. We don't really fit on either of the two industries we straddle. And pirates were kind of similar to that. Uh, Keith, again, in the morning lightning talks, uh, said that our industry, the game development industry, was started by people who did not know what they were doing. Uh, this was not the case by pirates. The pir piratical industry, insofar as it can be called one, was started by people who very much knew what they were doing and were doing it a very specific way. So I think we can learn from that perspective as well. Uh, other than starting, being started by people who very much knew what they were doing, uh, the more I read about pirates, the more I amuse myself by noting the various parallels with the game development industry and the game development community. So a quick historian's note, much of the modern mythology of pirates does not come from Disney. It does not come from popular things of the last hundred years, which is what I thought up until a couple of years ago before I started researching pirates seriously. By the way, there's lots of pictures in this presentation. Very few of them have anything to do with what I'm saying. I was originally not going to use slides, but then I decided I'm not compelling enough to do that. So there's something for you to look at, but a lot of them are just pirate pictures that I've been collecting. I have a folder of them. Um, anyway, so a lot of what we know about pirates does not come from Disney. It actually comes from much earlier than that. There's two things that it comes from particularly. This is the first one, which I mentioned a second ago, which is A History of Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson. Captain Charles Johnson was a fake captain. We do not actually know who he was. He was not a sea captain. We don't know who he was. He maybe, kind of, possibly, was Daniel Defoe, the English writer, who is best known for Robinson Crusoe. But we don't even know that, and that's disputed. There's about 10 people he could have been, some of which are women, some of which are famous writers in their own right, some of which are nobodies. Uh, it's very confusing. Uh, this work is from the late 1600s, early 1700s. It's basically a very fantastic uh, summary of what pirates do. Uh, a lot of our pirate mythology comes from this. The other thing, oh, sorry, uh, this is a, a quote from David Cordingley, who is Keeper of Pictures at the National Maritime Museum in the UK, which is a great title. I would love to be Keeper of Pictures. I hope to one day have that title. Uh, but Captain Johnson, the, the person who wrote that previous book, basically created our modern idea of pirates. He did not fake it, but he exaggerated it. He was, uh, he was sensationalizing the idea of something that he thought was interesting. The second thing that most of our pirate knowledge comes from is a book called The Buccaneers of America. It turns out there's two books called The Buccaneers of America. There's this one, and there's another one about a football team. So that's a modern football team. I'm not sure where they're from, but they're also in America, clearly. Uh, it's by Alexander X. Gwemelin. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Uh, nobody seems to know this gentleman's nationality. He might have been Dutch. He might have been French, maybe he was Flemish, which I guess is both of those. Uh, he wrote this book in 1678. He was a, a mad bastard, by all accounts, who was a surgeon and decided he loved the shit out of pirates, so he decided to go sail with as many pirates as he could, offering his services as a doctor, and then he wrote a book about them. Uh, he, he's a right psychopath, but he wrote a lot of really interesting things about pirates. He did not sensationalise as much as the other guy, uh, so this is a lot more precise, but he's still a, just a total mad bastard. Uh, he loved pirates. So, both of these books, one of them less than the other, but still both of them are a bit sensationalist. They're not flat out wrong, but they're a bit inaccurate. But we get a lot, if not everything, about what we know from, about pirates from these two books. Uh, so just bear in mind, much of our swashbuckling history understanding of pirates starts here. It's kind of fake news, it's kind of not fake news, it's a bit weird. So that's just some context for you. So what's a pirate? I'm sure you all have something in your head already of what a pirate is. To start, I'm just going to exclude some things for the purposes of this talk. A Viking is not a pirate, despite a Viking effectively meeting all the other definitions of what a pirate might be. 
Muslim raiders in the early thousands are not pirates, despite also meeting many of the editions of the pirate. And pretty much anyone else stealing things on the sea is not a pirate, unless they were doing it around the Caribbean between the 1600s and the 1800s. Uh, those are pirates. Vikings, Islamic raiders, and so on are really interesting in their own right, but they're not pirates for this definition and for my talk. They're super interesting. You should go learn about Vikings. My history degree is technically on Vikings. They're great. Go learn about them. But Vikings, not pirates. We're talking about pirates, 1600s to 1800s. Give or take, kind of. Um, pirates, most treacherous rogues. They terrorised the Caribbean mostly, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean. Uh, they were a loose confederation. They weren't part of any government. They're really interesting. They probably kind of look like Captain Pugwash, if anyone remembers Captain Pugwash. Uh, hopefully this guy kind of resembles most of what you have in your head when you think pirate. Uh, this is reasonably accurate. I'll explain something about the skull and crossbones later, though. Uh, so while Captain Pugwash was clearly a psychopath, uh, other media reinforced the idea of pirates as a disorganised, swashbuckling psycho even more so. Uh, lots and lots of things show them as intent on mayhem, utterly disorganised, thieving, pillaging, you know, disillusionment, confusion in their own crews, crimes constantly. Uh, this was actually not the case at all. Everything that this guy does as a pirate is mostly wrong. Um, pirates are actually more organised criminals. They're very, very organised very, very organised, very, very criminal. But I repeat, very organised. So if I want you to, to understand one thing about what actually pirates did, it's that they organised themselves, and that's what I think we can learn from them. So I want to make this clear, I don't think game developers are criminals. <laughs> um, I, had, I added this when I was, because I was running through my slides with somebody yesterday, and they're like, do you think game developers are all murderers? Like, no. Well, I'm sure there's some of them. I'm sure there's been a game developer who's a murderer, but uh, I'm not suggesting that we are murderers, criminals, or organised criminals of any sort. Uh, I just think a fun, quick history lesson is an entertaining break from the norm at a game dev conference, and I hope you can take something away from this. So I just want to put that out there. We are not criminals. We're not pirates. I'm not suggesting that. So, if it isn't obvious, one of the reasons I think pirates are so interesting is because they're very, very organised. And they had systems to make sure they stayed organised. They had checks and balances. They had all sorts of procedures. I love procedures. Procedures are great. Procedures help things tick along smoothly. So some modern scholars, particularly those with a libertarian bent in the US, have uh, made a lot of suggestions that pirates had democracy. They didn't. They didn't have democracy. They had bits of democracy that we might recognise, but they were not democratic as a whole. I wouldn't really go that far. It's a, it's a fun comparison to say pirates were very democratic, though. Uh, Pirates were surprisingly diverse. They had English, Welsh, and Scottish people on their crews. That's, that's very, very diverse. But no, pirates were actually surprisingly diverse. Uh, you know, 25 to 30% of each pirate crew is estimated to have been of African descent and have dark skin, which is probably a lot more than you would think, uh, especially in the Caribbean around there right, that, at that era. Uh, 2 to 10% of pirate crews were women. So some estimates place it upwards of 10%. Uh, that's honestly better than some game development studios. So, you know, we can, we can pick up our game there. But yeah, pirates were actually more diverse than you might expect. They did not all look like Captain Pugwash or Johnny Depp or Keith Richards. Um, some of the better known female pirates, like Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, who are these two, are actually the most interesting pirates, in my opinion, if you want to look at personalities. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to these two later. But they're really cool. Uh, most pirates, insofar as the world recognised them, were in the Caribbean. Uh, the Caribbean at the time was a dynamic area with frequently changing loyalties to Portugal, Spain, France, England, all sorts of places. Uh, a lot was going on. The two most prominent places by far uh, in most piratical stories are Hispaniola, which is now half Dominican Republic, half Haiti, and Tortuga, which is part of Haiti now. So this is the area we're talking about. You probably kind of vaguely know this from watching pirate movies, but probably have never really thought about it beyond that. Uh, piracy formed somewhat in response to English privateers who were effectively legal pirates run by the English, the Spanish, or the privateers run by every, every nation, but I'm talking about English ones here, uh, which were kind of like uh, hired navies that weren't really the navy but could do things that the navy wasn't allowed to do. So they were basically legal pirates insofar as the way we'd think about them. They, they fought everyone on behalf of the English, were paid by the English, but were independent from the navy. Uh, other countries had their own versions as well. Um, so Francis Drake, this guy, you've probably heard of him, was probably the most famous privateer. Sometimes privateers are called buccaneers. They're not quite the same thing, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. Just important to point out, privateers slash buccaneers are not pirates. Uh, again, so Francis Drake, the most famous one. Uh, 
So most pirates were actually, for the most part, former buccaneers or privateers who used to work for one of the states uh, and then lost their gig after wars were done and they didn't need them anymore or treaties were signed and they didn't need them anymore. Uh, so wars led to jobs, people got hired, made big privateer crews, uh, then wars finished, treaties got signed, there were no jobs, there was another war, so on. Hopefully this pattern sounds pretty familiar. Uh, this is my first hilarious joke. So AAA studios get, get closed and people become indie and then the cycle repeats itself. It's obviously <coughs> something that we're all familiar with, but you can look at any industry and see the same thing. So basically what I'm trying to say here is you should understand what's going on here. Pirates came from an economic need to have a job after the thing they were doing before didn't exist anymore. They were very experienced seamen, naval kind of people who knew how to fight. There were often attempts made to bring pirates back into the big leagues, uh, the legitimate seafaring life, the legitimate life, uh, when authorities felt it was necessary. This is a picture of a guy called Woods Rogers, who's on the right. It's the really fancy looking one. Uh, he's a former pirate. He was made royal governor of the Bahamas because they thought that he would help bring pirates on board and also help get pirates to dob in their mates. Uh, he was not a well-liked fellow among pirates because he was basically a traitor as far as they were concerned, but he was a pretty good governor by all accounts and did a lot to bring pirates on board. Um, the way I think of this is basically how do you do fellow kids, but instead how do you do fellow pirates? <laughs> um, hopefully that makes sense. They basically were trying to lure pirates to do things based on uh, an existing relationship or connection with a person. And again, I think there's parallels in the game development industry here. I think we can see, we don't have to look very far or draw too long a bow to think about this in the context of game development. Uh, I'm using parallels in the game industry. You know, you look hard enough, it makes me giggle. So, you know, people change allegiances constantly. <laughs> um, it happens over and over again. Uh, and again, I'm deliberately drawing a long bow here because I think it's funny, but we can learn a lot from history, is my point. Pirates and those with pirate skills, which basically mean anyone in the Navy or a privateer, uh, they had a nuanced, very specific set of skills, which were in demand. Basically, it was pirates were easy to hire, to put it another way. Um, I think that's kind of funny to compare to games repeatedly, just because they change back and forth. Pirates were effectively indie versions of the Navy. It's a bit weird, but that's really how it worked. Uh, so pirate crews, they were regularly up to 100 people, if not more, 150. There were lots of pirate jobs going around. Because the crews were so big, they kind of needed a sensible team structure. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how pirates formed their teams and worked in that team structure now. So pirate teams actually had a lot of named roles, which were surprisingly adhered to fairly strictly. Uh, these are the big named roles that most pirates followed. Hopefully most of these terms are familiar with you to some extent. Uh, the captain, very important. This is uh, Blackbeard, who I'm sure you've seen in various places. Uh, the captain was actually elected uh, by all the people in the crew and could be replaced by a majority vote of the crew. So there were a lot of cowardly or really stupid captains who got replaced very quickly. They were just voted out. It was really surprisingly orderly. Uh, captains were expected to be dependable and reliable seamen. Uh, they were also expected to be bold and decisive uh, since their job was basically to figure out how to engage targets in battle, how to escape authorities and how to deal with an attack. Captains were actually not in charge of the ship beyond those matters. Uh, the reason they had a captain was because when there was a battle, there was no time to take a vote and figure out what to do. They needed somebody whose authority would be respected and a decision made that could be followed. So contrary to most popular showing of pirates, the captain did not have all seeing, all authority over the ship. Uh, on the surface, a captain might seem like a problematic idea for pirates. They, if they have unquestioned authority, then you know, they can make stupid decisions. But because they chose a captain with elections, uh, that meant you know, they were really kind of responsible for their own captain, so if they got themselves into a mess, they could fix it by holding a new election. Um, they would change captains pretty often. I think that if I read you, which I was going to read this, but then I decided it would take 10 minutes and be too long, there's a really good sort of examination of a pirate election. If you change the language to be slightly more modern, it just sounds like something Anthony Green would say on election night in Australia. Uh, elections haven't changed for a long time in terms of the way people describe them and characterise them. Uh, pirate ships would change captains constantly, like constantly, like on a weekly basis sometimes, like faster than we change prime ministers. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about like that. Uh, 
Pirates often came, as I said, from the Navy or from privateers, which means they knew what effect a shit captain could have on the crew. So they made a lot of checks and balances to limit the captain's power and keep him in check to make sure he didn't just go nuts and ruin them all. Uh, they were In the Navy, there was no such democratic procedure to remove a captain. So if you were stuck on a, cap on a ship with a shit captain, you were basically stuffed until you managed to get to a different ship. But the pirates learnt that from their experience in the Navy and as privateers, so when they ended up on their own, they paid attention to it. Uh, this is a quote from Captain Charles Johnson, again, the fake captain. He's, he knows his shit, he's just, we don't know who he was. Uh, basically, it says that they were aware of how awful a bad captain could be and made sure not to do it again regularly. Uh, here, here's another great quote that I really like from, again, Captain Johnson. Uh, they would only permit their captain to be captain on the condition that they, they were captain over him, which means they basically were keeping an eye on the captain at all times, at, at, at all possible. Uh, the captain was not the all-powerful rogue to which they, they swore loyalty like the movies and media would make it out to be. Uh, here's a quote from an actual pirate, Captain Bartholomew Roberts, who I'll talk about again later. Uh, basically says, you know, if the captain doesn't do good shit, they'll, they'll, they'll get rid of him. Uh, and they did. They got rid of captains regularly. Uh, they often didn't kill the captain when they got rid of him, when they felt he was bad. They just voted him out and he became a member of the crew. Sometimes if they really didn't like him, they would keel haul him. Uh, for those who don't know, keel hauling is when you strap someone to a rope and then drag them under the ship. Uh, at worst, they would become seriously injured and then get pulled back on board. At best, they would become seriously injured and pulled back on board. At worst, they would be completely shredded by the barnacles attached to the ship and you would end up with mints. Uh, there's a lot of descriptions of this which I've been reading. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm now on some sort of watch list at the University of Tasmania where I access my journals because I've been reading so much about pirate mints. It's not great. Mints was the term. They, they call it mints. Um, it's not just me being silly. So, yeah, don't read about keel hauling. Um, so the second big role on the ship was the quartermaster. The quartermaster had exactly the same authority as a captain. He was effectively a second captain. Uh, the captain had authority in battle. The quartermaster had authority every other time. Uh, the crew elected the quartermaster to represent their interests. Uh, he commanded the captain outside of battle. Uh, his jobs included keeping order, settling conflicts, uh, determining the amount of food and drink and uh, plunder to be distributed. Uh, Long John Silver from Treasure Island, pictured from Treasure Planet, though, uh, was Captain Flint's quartermaster in the book, Treasure Island. Uh, he's probably the most famous quartermaster I could think of, but I'm sure there's others. Uh, he could override the pirates' articles of agreement, which we'll get to shortly. So pirates had laws called articles of agreement. Uh, so the quartermaster was effectively a second captain. So they had two captains. This, again, not really well represented in most media. Uh, this is a quote from a captain who went straight and wrote books about pirates. Uh, the quartermaster was the pirate captain when they were not at battle, is basically all that quote says. Uh, he was in charge of everything on the ship when they weren't fighting. And he, in many ways, wielded more authority than the person with the name captain. So that's the captain, the quartermaster. There's also the sailing master who oversaw navigation and sailing. Uh, often, because of their skills, the sailing master was someone they had, how can I put this nicely, stolen from the Navy. Um, so the pirates would identify a effective sailor and they would take him and keep him. What are you going to do if you're a really good sailor? Are you going to let the boat sink? I mean, eventually, I guess, they just decided to stay on board or escaped but most sailing masters were actually just people they'd kidnapped. Uh, the boatswain took care of the boat. He supervised supplies. He looked at the ship, reported on the ship's condition to the quartermaster and the captain, uh, and did boatswain things. Uh, he also made sure that the sails were well maintained uh, and that the anchor was well maintained and things like that. It's pretty standard. Carpenter, carpentered. <laughs> the carpenter would actually often be the surgeon, you know, wood, bones. <laughs> Same thing, really. Uh, and the, the master gunner and the mate, and there are lots of mates, uh, and so on and so on. You know, the, these ones are less interesting. Uh, point is, lots of defined roles and people stuck to their role. They knew what they needed to do and did it. They did not uh, deviate from their duty. What we actually have here, and again, the libertarian historians who look at this stuff really go, go very hard on the fact that this is kind of resembles a democracy if you squint. Uh, they love to point out that this is an executive, a judiciary, and a legislature. The captain, who 
was effectively the executive branch. The quartermaster, who looked at disagreements and doled out punishments and things, was the judiciary. And the rest of the crew was the legislature, voting on what they wanted to be done. It's kind of a democracy. You, like, take your glasses off. Don't really think it's actually democratic, but it's, it's certainly the idea is there. Because of this, there were lots of checks and balances. Uh, pirates kept an eye on what was going on at all times. There's this chasse-party, I think is how it's pronounced. pronounced. Uh, it's described by Alexander X. Squemelin, who is the Dutch, Flemish, French, maybe, we're not sure, nutter, we previously mentioned, who sailed on ships as their surgeon and then wrote about them. Uh, basically, they came up with what they were going to do and wrote it up, drew up an agreement, uh, which specified who gets what, how, how it gets doled out, what happens, how many bits and pieces different people get. Uh, earlier pirates, this was just a verbal agreement. Later pirates... They institutionalised it and became, came up with a set of meta-rules. Uh, this has various names, Articles of Agreement, the Pirate Code, Chaspati, Custom of the Coast, Jamaica Discipline. There's, there's names for this all over the place. It's just a contract. Uh, some of the pirates signed a thing. They actually physically signed a contract. Uh, this is something from like a kid's playground. I'm not sure where I got this picture from. Uh, but yeah, lots of pirates signed contracts uh, that actually said what they were going to do. It was very, very orderly. Like, it was surprisingly orderly. When the pirate crew onboarded a new crewmate, there was like an onboarding procedure where they would, you know, get their contract and be shown their desk and where they would work. And it was actually, you would recognise this process. It's not exaggerating to say. It's a very modern onboarding process that didn't arrive in other industries until much, much later. Uh, in the 18th century, pirates even built, you know, a generic framework of constitutions that could be used and passed between pirate crews. So they all started to become homogenous. Um, basic elements of pirate, constitu pirate constitutions by like the 1720s were all the, pretty much the same thing. They were all based on the same sort of templates. Uh, captain Johnson, our FA captain, refers to the laws of this company, principal customs and government of this roguish commonwealth, which are pretty near the same with all pirates. So by a certain point, pirates had become pretty consistent in the way they behaved, and they'd actually codified it to the point where one pirate could behave on another crew and, and understand what's expected without having to understand the unique facets of that crew. No, oh, I've even got a quote. Look at that. That's the same thing I just said. Sorry. So, articles of agreement required a reasonable unanimous consent from a crew. Uh, pirates would check or at least assess their articles of uh, agreement before they launched on a new expedition where treasure might be expected. Uh, Pirates would sometimes swear on the Bible, if they were religious, or more often not on the hatchet. Um, and they would literally swear on a hatchet the way people might recognise swearing on a Bible. So they took these things pretty seriously. These pirate rules were actually followed. And here's some example pirate rules which I particularly enjoyed. Uh, this is Captain Bartholomew Roberts, who is a real pirate. He looks very dapper in his dress. I guess it's a dress. I'm not sure what that's called, but he looks dapper. Uh, he said, he, this is his first pirate rule, I'm going to give you a sample of them. Every man has a vote in affairs of moment. His equal has equal title to pr fresh, fresh provisions, strong liquors at any time seized, and may use them at pleasure, unless a scarcity, not an uncommon thing among them, makes it necessary for the good of all to vote a retrenchment. So basically, every pirate gets food, gets booze, as long as we're not running out. And running out happens occasionally, so be aware. That's pretty much what that says. Uh, Another pirate rule from this guy, no person to game at cards or dice for money. Again, most pirate media portrays pirates as a gambling bunch. They weren't. Uh, here's one I like. Pirates had an enforced bedtime. The lights and candles to be put out at 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> if any of the crew after that hour still remained inclined for drinking, they were to do it on the open deck. So basically, go outside if you're going to be drinking or partying after 8 o'clock. We don't want any of that rubbish here. Uh, yeah, they were really organised. It's surprising. Uh, here's, here's a good one. No striking one another on board. Every man's quarrels to be ended on shore, at sword or pistol. The quartermaster of the ship, when the parties will not come to reconciliation, will accompany them and make sure they kill each other. <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you get the idea. Um, if both miss when they're fighting each other, uh, the one who draws the first blood is declared the victor and they can both come back. Uh, so, this is the most, I've saved the one I find the most interesting to last. 
And this is the one the libertarians really seize upon. But again, I'm going to leave that to a side. I'm just telling you about the libertarian thing because a lot of pirate scholarship, if you Google this, comes from very libertarian scholars who have a very specific bent when they talk about it. So this is the most interesting one to me, though. No man to talk of breaking up their way of living till each had shared 1,000 pounds. If in order to do this, any man should lose a limb or become a cripple in their service, he was to have 800 pounds out of the public stock and for lesser hurts proportionally. What that basically says is pirate health care. Um, a really common aspect of pirate codes was injury compensation, to, which was to come from the ship's share of things, not in the individual pirate's share of things. And they made sure pirates were well looked after because they wanted to attract people to join their crew. So if you, you, you're not going to, you know, if you're a really good pirate, are you going to join the crew that's going to pay you out if you lose a leg, or are you going to join the crew that's just going to kick you off the ship? You're going to join the one that's going to pay you out. It made sense. There was a lot of precision and order and structure to life on a pirate ship. It was much more structured than most modern media might lead you to believe. Uh, pirates were successful because they were organised. Again, that's something I'd like you to take away from this talk. They were so organised. They were scarily organised. They organised literally everything. They fought through literally everything. They were so organised that they did not bury treasure, as a matter of course. So this pirate buried treasure thing is mostly a myth. Uh, they did it occasionally, but most of the reason pirates would bury treasure was to fuck with the English. So if they knew the English were going to board them, or the Spanish, or the, you know, the Portuguese, uh, and go through their ship, they, they, they might bury the treasure. But they would go get it the same day. They're not going to like bury treasure as a matter of course. You, why, why would you bury your takings when you need to go sell it and get on with the job? You know, we don't build gains and then hide them, unless you're Baris K. But um, <laughs> we, we don't build a game which is designed never to be played. We, we don't do our jobs without wanting to you know, show the world. So pirates didn't really bury stuff as a matter of course. There are occasional stories of buried treasure, but from what we can tell, most of the buried treasure thing came up somewhere between the 1800s and now through novels like uh, Robert Louis Stevenson and Disney and things like that. There are a couple of mentions of it in the past, but it's hard to tell. Uh, it doesn't look like it's accurate. So that's one thing. They're also really organised in their marketing departments. Uh, pirates used a flag. It was called the Jolly Roger. Uh, but all pirate flags were called a Jolly Roger. It is not that particular pattern, which is a Jolly Roger. Uh, a Jolly Roger is a term for a pirate flag. Uh, no matter what picture it showed. Uh, this picture is a Jolly Roger captioned in the 18th century by the British, which is one of the oldest ones we have. This is one of the few, we, I'm talking like I could count on one hand, that looked like this. Most of them did not look like this. Uh, scary pirate flags were not always the same picture. They were all scary. They were all like threatening, daggery, speary, spiky things, or death, or something that one made you scared. It was a marketing exercise, a piece of art designed to make, make sure you knew you were going to deal with a pirate and that you should you know, surrender, uh, because they were so damn well organised that they would take your shit or kill you, so you may as well just give them your shit before they take it. Uh, it worked. Merchant and Navy ships would frequently surrender their cargo or their ships to pirates rather than fight, because it was just much more efficient that way. Uh, pirates were renowned for their efficiency. Uh, the reason the Jolly Roger is now mostly seen as black is because racism. Uh, Muslim and Islamic artefacts are often a black thing with white text. So if you think of the modern ISIS flag from the terrorist group, that is the same origin as the Jolly Roger. And at some point, the English, again, decided that, you know, pirates were probably scary Islamic people and decided to spread that as a thing. So that is why the Jolly Roger that we see these days is actually black and white. Most of them were coloured. Um, they, you know, they didn't really understand flags because they weren't very educated. So they often, you know, saw colourful French, Spanish, English flags and then made their own colourful thing and hang it on their ship. It's not necessarily a exercise in making a scary looking black and white. They were, they were very artistic. They're pirates. Um, so yeah, marketing department worked very efficiently. Um, such an organised bunch also did not speak strangely. Uh, that's a Hollywood thing. Lionel Barrymore, who's best known for playing the kind of a villain Mr Potter in It's a Wonderful Life, uh, played uh, a pirate in a 1934 film, which you may have heard of, called Treasure Island, uh, and slipped in an R, and then it stuck. Um, pirates came from random places in England, they mostly just had English accents. Pirates came from random places in Spain, France, Portugal, Africa, they mostly just had whatever accents. They weren't very educated, they often spoke a little strangely. They did not say ar and yar and mihartis and stuff like that. That is entirely fabricated. Uh, the, you know, they needed to communicate with each other, so they, they didn't speak gibberish. Um, so this is a bad guy, uh, well, badder than a pirate who is being murdered by another pirate. Uh, it just so happens that this guy is being murdered by a lady pirate who is revealing her femininity to him just as she kills him. Um, because, you know, she's probably not supposed to be there. Uh, 
This is Mary Reed, who was one of the most famous lady pirates. Uh, pirates were a very organized bunch. Uh, pirates kind of recognized the benefits of diversity. Kind of. Sort of. A little bit. Okay, not really, but there were more lady pirates than you might think. There's actually quite a lot of them. This is Anne Bonny, who is another lady pirate. Uh, she has been variously described in the following ways. She's been described as a mad Irish woman. She's been described by a different person as a beautiful red-headed woman who was a good catch. She's been described as an utterly ruthless businesswoman not to be messed with. And she has been described as terrifying. Uh, when she was 13, she stabbed a servant girl with a knife. Uh, she married a poor sailor and small-time pirate who was kind of basically a smuggler named James Bonney. Uh, he basically just wanted her father's estate, but, but they loved each other, so it goes. Uh, her father did not like her husband, uh, so she burnt down his farm. Um, and they left. You know, as you do. She became pretty famous. Uh, she and her husband moved to Nassau, uh, which was currently being governed by Woods Rogers, who was the ex pirate turned governor I mentioned earlier. Uh, and her husband decided he didn't like the pirate life anymore, became an informant to that governor. Uh, she didn't like that, so she killed him. Uh, maybe, we're not sure. She, we think she tried to kill him, we're not sure if she succeeded. His, his like, history notes kind of trail off there. We have mineral records. Anyway, she left with Captain Jack Rackham, who you may have heard of, uh, who, where she became his lover and effectively second in command of his ship. Uh, she may or may not have dressed as a man at this point. We're not 100% sure. It, there seems to be some evidence that the crew knew she was a woman, but nobody else did, so it's hard to tell. Uh, on board this ship, she met Mary Reed, who was pretending to be a man, uh, apparently they got jealous of each other, spending too much time with the captain, and revealed to each other that they were women at some point, and then they also became lovers. So, pirates, interesting social dynamics, much more interesting than you might expect. Uh, upon the capture and uh, subsequent hanging of Jack Rackham, uh, Mary casually mentioned to him just before his death that if only he'd been more manly, he might have survived. Uh, so Mary and Anne, quite, quite brutal, uh, but there were a lot more lady pirates than you probably think there were. Uh, yeah. The crews with known lady pirates were markedly more successful than the crews without them. Is this ringing a bell to anyone? Uh, the pirates, much later, came to recognise and even acknowledge that diversity helped, whether that was diversity of gender or diversity of where their pirate crew came from. But these sorts of things were added to their articles of agreement later on, much later on, so we're talking the very late phase of the Caribbean pirates. They really did acknowledge that more diversity meant more success, and they tried to work for it. In fucking incredible, who would have thought? Um, more diversity equals more success. More organisation equals more success. Pirates cleanly split different kinds of tasks explicitly between each other, uh, different members of the team. The captain was responsible for big strategic stuff, command during battle, negotiating uh, alliances, things like that. The quartermaster was operational. He allocated supplies, adjudicated conflicts, punished people, coordinating for sick and injured. Uh, human resources folk, like modern ones, sometimes call these different tasks star tasks and guardian tasks. There's a whole lingo for this, which is I don't understand it. I'm not an HR person, but... Pirates recognised this and came up with their own ways to work with this. Pirate HR department, which was effectively the quartermaster, acknowledged the need to give people who had certain skills certain jobs. Uh, when star and guardian tasks are lumped together, various problems ensue. People who can do an entire spectrum of tasks uh, don't usually have the same skill level all those tasks. So pirates knew this and designed their crews accordingly. Uh, at the very highest levels of like our business structures these days and the way people build their companies, we do this still, so we have companies that are run by like the CEO and the COO, and it's not all the same role. But this split becomes much less defined the lower you get in a business these days. So I think we could kind of pay attention to the way we do this. And again, a starting point to learn about this is pirates. That's fun. Um, at a certain point, pirates became performative because there was so much being written about pirates and their expected behaviours and the fact that they you know, wore fancy costumes and things like that. It became hard to separate genuine pirate behaviour from the behaviour that people were adopting because they felt it was expected of pirates. So pirates read about pirates and then decided to be more piratey based on what the pirate book said. Um, it's basically just... This is good and bad. Um, it led to better treatment all around because pirates read about other pirates having articles of agreement and how pirate crews should run and decided to adopt that. Uh, they also started dressing like this guy because books said that they dressed like this guy. It happened a lot. Um, it was kind of bad because pirates came, became kind of homogenous and felt like their team and structure needed to be the same. Um, so walking the plank, this is one of my favourites, walking the plank was not a thing. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the preferred most significant pirate punishment was keel hauling. It really didn't happen very often, though. Uh, there's one particular pirate whose name we don't know, but he's talked about a lot, who heard about keel hauling, I heard about walking the plank from various books 
where mostly English writers had made it up and declared that this was how pirates tortured people. And he thought, well, that's, that sounds interesting. I'll try it. Um, so he tried punishing his crew with walking the plank. He decided it was crap and went back to keel hauling. Um, <laughs> pirates were learning from the media. It's, you know, it's, it's, it was a process. Um, they're very adaptable. They, they moved fast. They, they tried things. They moved quickly. They adjusted to new working situations as needed. Uh, when governments started cracking down on piracy and making it uh, a thing they would punish very severely if you were caught, uh, that made it hard to recruit. So, you know, you can't, you're not going to want to join a pirate crew if you think you're going to get murdered by the government for doing so. Uh, so in response, pirates worked together and began to pretend collectively en masse across the entire Caribbean that they had forcibly impressed crew members to join their team when, in fact, those crew members had joined themselves. So pirates started a big marketing campaign to say, you know, we've, we've basically shanghai obviously not going to say shanghai I'm saying shanghai uh, crew members to join our crew. We've forced them here. They're not, they're not, you know, they haven't willingly joined. They would never willingly join us. We're pirates. You know, we've, we've brought them here under the, against their will. Uh, they even placed ads to that effect in seaport newspapers regularly all, all over the Caribbean, which basically meant if a new recruit got captured, he could testify that he'd been forced to become a pirate and they would let him off. So pirates were very, very clever. This was a really clean way of getting around a problem. Pirates did this regularly. They adapted quickly and cleanly to things. Uh, pirates quickly realised that material inequalities uh, would lead to a lack of trust and you know, people don't want to collaborate when they're being paid in inequally. Uh, so they made regular adjustments. They, you know, they had pay reviews. They had performance reviews. They checked how people were being paid. Pirate codes uh, described in detail how people were paid. There was a need to establish this order so they didn't quarrel, and once they agreed, they would sign to a ship and they would agree with that. Uh, it, you know, crew members received one share, the captain received two, the quartermaster received two. That was pretty much it. Uh, this payment system was absolutely radical for its time. It decentralised the wealth. Uh, it was precisely the opposite of the elaborate pay structures the big navies had. So it was totally different. Um, you know, indie studios experiment with the way we get paid. It still happens now. Uh, this is Marcus Redica, who is a professor of history at a modern United States University, who said it's actually one of the more, more egalitarian plans for you know, paying people anywhere in that century. So it really was well ahead of its time. So now you know a little bit more about pirates. What can you actually take away? So you know, obviously you, you kind of seeing where I'm coming from here. Uh, and I, if it's not obvious so far, I say this with my tongue firmly in my cheek. Uh, there's a lot of things pirates did well for varying definitions of well, and we could learn a few things from that. Uh, if not the actual approach or implementation, we can just learn the general philosophy from these pirates. Management, diversity, and leadership, these are things that pirates held to be very important. And they went about making sure their management, their diversity plans, and their leadership plans were all strongly codified and written in place as something they knew how to do. And was written down, if not verbally handed down. Uh, I've said this quite a few times, Group dynamics that promote cooperative action are very, very good. Uh, think about your group dynamics. Good dynamics led to good things. Uh, something that historians like to talk about with piracy is that they nurtured a lot of American democracy. This is, again, the libertarians coming out. Um, pirates sold food and supplies to random colonies where none of the big powers would go. Uh, they put their money back into the economy that they lived in. Um, liquor, food, gambling, entertainment. Um, Many historians and economists are of the consensus that if pirates hadn't existed, some of the colonies in the Caribbean would not have survived and become democracies today. So pirates did have an ongoing good effect because of their structure. Again, game developers are not pirates. This was just a fun way of talking about some history that people might find interesting, as well as pointing out there's more to team structure than being like every other group. You can shake things up a little bit. You don't need to become performative. I'm a bit worried that game development has become performative lately. Uh, good dynamics promote cooperative action. Good. I can't say this enough times. I really, this is my big takeaway here. Uh, when you're building your team, think about more variety in your team. Think about the structure of your team. If you have, have the opportunity, don't just assume that a top-down structure is the only way you can operate. Think about how and why certain team dynamics lead to certain outcomes. And that's what pirates did. It's really important to them. We're game developers. We're used to considering how mechanics and dynamics affect the result of something. Um, why aren't we doing this more often in our workplaces? I don't know. Team structure, very important. Think about how things affect each other. If you want to learn more about team structure, the GDC Vault has a lot of really good videos in the production track. Uh, 
a lot of programmers and designers avoid the production track of GDC in similar conferences because they think it's boring, but it's actually really interesting. I strongly recommend checking them out. Some of them on YouTube. Pirates saw a lot about how the mechanics and the dynamics of their teams affected their ability to achieve their goals. And they were not the swashbuckling psychopaths that you might have thought they were. Uh, they were actually very, very organized criminals. We should not be the criminal bit. We should just be organized. So again, my three big takeaways. Multiple leadership roles. Pirates understood that people with different talents were needed to fulfill different roles. Uh, spread up your tasks as needed to the people who are clearly allocated to do something. Have a control system, a code of operation, something that people can look at and know that they feel comfortable within. They can report problems. They can understand what they're meant to do. And make a system that supports people to get their jobs done. As long as it's fair, people will actually do a lot of good work. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Pirates are pretty cool. Hopefully you go learn a little bit more about them in your own time. Group dynamics lead to good, interesting things. That is my big takeaway here again. Think about your group dynamics if you're making a game in a team. Get behind efforts to collectivize if that gels with your particular philosophy. Uh, recalibrate and rearrange the business structures you use to make better use of your people. Don't be afraid to diverge from the usual. The game industry does not need to become performative of every other entity in the industry. The last thing we want to do is become performative. You do not need to behave like everyone else because that leads to this. Uh, I have some recommendations for further reading if you want to learn about pirates. Uh, the first one is this book. This, this book. It's really good, but it also comes from a very American libertarian bent. So read it with that in mind. This guy is an economist, not a historian, so he comes at it from an economics perspective, not a history perspective. He gets a bit of the history wrong, but he's really interesting regardless. Uh, this is a personal favorite of mine. This is called Pirate Women. I strongly recommend this book. Uh, it's just, it's swashbuckling stories of like hilarious pirates, pirate antics basically. Uh, this is kind of from the Silicon Valley perspective where they think they're really edgy by talking about hackers and gangsters and pirates, but there's some good stuff in here as well. Uh, it's called The Misfit Economy. And this is a story about a like, one specific set of pirates that gets up to a bunch of action. Uh, again, I highly recommend all of these books. So that's everything from me today. Thank you for indulging me in a history talk at GCAP. I hope it was useful. Please come and visit Tasmania. It's really nice there. Uh, I will be putting some notes and a kind of essay thing on my website about this at some point soon. So if you didn't manage to take photos of the books or whatever, I will put a list up. Follow me on Twitter if you want to see me tweet that out. Otherwise, also just tell me this was stupid. Thank you very much. Have a good GCAP. I only have three minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, feel free to shout at me. Sure. Uh, yep. Yeah, so the question is, the sailing masters who are often basically taken to be part of the crew, uh, did eventually they become regular parts of the crew that got hired? Yes, they did, absolutely. Pirates started recruiting, and the more formalized and normalized the pirate structure became, the easier it was for them to hire normal people uh, instead of steal them. Yeah. Anyone else got a question? Yeah. So basically everyone got the same share except for the captain and the quartermaster who got double what everyone else got individually. That was pretty much what consistently became a thing. Um, they paid equally because anyone could be elevated to the captain at any point because of the way they worked. If anyone's seen Star Trek where the Klingons fight each other to become the new chancellor or captain of a ship, it's basically that. But they elected instead of four. Uh, and the pay was pretty much equal, which was one of the really interesting things about pirates. Put them back there. Yes. Ah, yes. That's just because I wanted to have a, a terrible pun. I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, most of the history, historical literature on pirates is full of puns because historians think they're funny. <laughs> uh, 
Maybe. There's been some people who suggested that pirate speech is because it was because of drunken slurring. More, more realistically, it's because, again, not meaning to make fun of the English, I have English heritage, uh, it's probably more likely that the English were racist against the Irish and the Scottish and were making fun of the way they spoke. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine that depends on the ship, but by and large, pirates codified that they shouldn't be beating each other up on the ship. Uh, one interesting thing that appeared in sort of the last 50 years of the Golden Age of Piracy was they codified that you shouldn't assault women. Uh, they would get kicked off the crew if you inappropriately touched a woman, which is, you know, very ahead of its time. Obviously, pirates were still a pretty horrifying bunch, but that appeared at the later stages and was something that they adhered to pretty strictly. Um, Uh, they did not fight each other as much as you would think. They often teamed up to do uh, missions together where they would decide something was big enough to warrant a larger crew and they would team up and split it equally. But that was rel relatively infrequent. Um, but they did do that. They, weren't most, they weren't mo mostly weren't fighting each other. I think we have time for one more question. Anyone? Yep. Um, how soon the uh, they weren't allowed to be drunk on the ship most of the time outside of like... Well, during working hours, it was very appropriate for a pirate to be drunk, basically. It was a very modern conception. Uh, that was much later in the pirate period where they started formalising these rules. Uh, early on, I suspect they were drunk a lot of the time. Um, what we consider drunk and what was considered drunk by a naval or seaman or buccaneer standards at that era is probably quite different, though. So, like, you know, we're talking, like, nicely sozzled at work versus flat out on the floor. So they're probably at the nicely sozzled level early on all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Please come and chat to me if you want to talk about pirates. Um.